Jetmere Nexus of Revels. This is a token swarm aggro deck, and Jetmere himself is primarily three uh, static abilities. The first one is that your creatures have plus one plus oh in vigilance as long as you have three or more creatures. Second one is he has your creatures get another plus one plus oh and trample as long as you have six or more. And then the strongest effect is that your creatures get another plus one plus oh and have double strike if you have nine. Now Jetmere also counts in the creature count here and so a lot of times this deck is just trying to count to eight. Before I go over the deck, I want to talk about how aggro works in Commander, because those who come from 1v1 formats are probably used to aggro being some sort of play small creatures, uh, whittle them down early, and then by the time they are in the game, uh, you know they're usually at some sort of low life count, and you just need to figure out how to sneak in the last bits of damage to close out the game. That obviously does not work in Commander when there are multiple opponents who have double the life that you would normally expect in the other formats. So instead of dealing 20 damage very quickly, you now need to deal 120 damage very quickly. And so most aggro decks in Commander are some sort of alpha strike deck. The most famous aggro commander is probably Krenko, Mob Boss. And if you think about the way Krenko typically wins, it's by making a bunch of goblins with a haste effect and then having some sort of combat buff like you know your creatures get plus two plus zero, oh, or you know perhaps even multiple combat buffs uh, and then swinging for a huge amount of damage in a single turn some cranko ducks also make infinite tokens with haste which is another variation of uh, alpha strike i would consider alpha strike to be kind of like a combo deck uh, except you're specifically trying to build a critical mass of creatures uh, for a single game-winning turn rather than some sort of uh, infinite loop uh, or um, any sort of non-creature based loop that just in incidentally happens to kill all your opponents. Uh, the other form of aggro deck that you'll typically see in Commander is Voltron. And Voltron doesn't necessarily have to be aggro. You can build a Voltron deck that is slower, uh, but the Voltron aggro variant is something like Skullbriar, where they will cast their commander quickly and then just attack, 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 and then recast the commander, attack, 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 usually buffing the commander uh, in multiple ways throughout the game. Uh, but that is how aggro typically works in commander. It's a little bit different than you're probably used to if you're coming, if you're coming into this format from 1v1 formats. Um, a lot of aggro decks in commander at least the effective ones, are some variation of what I would call an alpha strike deck. So it's important to keep that in mind uh, before we go into covering uh, Jetmere, Nexus, and Revels. When it comes to win conditions, uh, this sort of deck is based around the commander. Uh, there's several different types of commanders you can build around. Some are value engines that uh, are enablers, you know, decks where you play the commander and utilize the commander to find the win conditions in your deck. And then decks like Jetmere uh, have the enablers in the deck and their win condition is in the command zone. And so this sort of deck is, uh, it pretty much only needs one win condition and that is the commander. It doesn't need alternate win conditions, doesn't necessarily need combos. And that's what you'll typically find of decks like Jetmere. And so because of that, I only have listed two win conditions here. Arguably, the second one doesn't come into play, I want to say, 90 to 95% of the time. The way this deck wins is by casting its commander and attacking. And if your commander dies, you just do it again. It's a win con in the command zone. And in the case you can't cast your commander because you don't have enough mana, uh, I guess you can use Elish Norn, but from my experience, uh, even if you have to cast your commander a third time, you're still going to win off your commander and not because of Elish Norn. So, in general, think of this deck as only having one win condition, but one that is repeatable and always available from the command zone. The deck strategy is to first ramp with mana dorks, then establish both a token engine and a draw engine, and then assemble the critical mass when using the commander. On the commander, or rather deck archetype circle, uh, you know we have aggressive, unfair, fair, and reactive. Uh, we are a swarm deck, that's in the top right. 
which I would categorize as fast and fair. In general, decks that are in the top left, which are unfair and fast, are combo decks. And they are prioritizing cards that give them speed, as well as protection for the combo. The closer a deck is to the bottom right, which is more reactive and more fair, the more stacks, the more um, removal, and just in general, the, the more interaction those sorts of decks are going to have to have in order to compete with the fast combo decks in the top left. And so oftentimes you'll see in lower power tables, people will ban stacks cards saying that they're unfair. And what primarily wins at those lower power tables are primarily combo decks or just uh, other alpha strike decks that assemble some sort of massive value on the board through something like Cascade and Alpha Strike, the entire board, which is also some, you know, arguably a variation of combo. For a healthy meta, you generally want to um, allow stacks into your playgroup just so that you can see the full spectrum of commander decks uh, potentially show up in the pod. So common threats to this strategy, uh, counter spells, curse totem effects, anything that prevents us from using our creatures, fast combo, as mentioned previously, any deck that's really faster than us, uh, we have to tutor for stacks or otherwise you know, remove some of their cards in order to slow them down. And of course, creature removal. We are a critical mass creature deck, and so anything that removes creatures is really strong against us. Here are some common examples of those threats listed here. In terms of ramp, there are 11 pieces. Uh, generally, if you want to see something from your deck every game, uh, you have a pretty good shot if you have 10 pieces, 10 copies of that sort of type. So here we have the one mana dorks. Uh, these are the highest priority to mulligan for. But if you don't have them and you have one of the you know, two mana ramp cards instead, I still think it's fine to uh, keep that hand as long as you have two lands. And of course, we have the non-creature ramp pieces as well. These are also fine to keep, but it just means that you'll have a bit of a slower game because your, your fastest games, the ones where you're threatening the table and turn five or turn six are going to come whenever you have some sort of creature-based ramp. And of course, the last card here is Smothering Tithe. I, keep, I include it, even though some people argue that it's slow. Um, but because we typically open with a Mana Dork, it's not uncommon to cast Smothering Tithe on turn three. Uh, generally, I'd say on turn four, it can be a little slow. But um, this deck is capable of getting out uh, on, on turn three pretty consistently whenever you have Smothering Tithe in the opening hand. And so, to me, it's always felt like a ramp piece to in, in other decks that are uh, not as heavy on the mana dorks. Uh, I can see it being potentially slower, but I do count it as a ramp piece here. Uh, card advantage. So we only have seven sources of card advantage, which generally means you're going to have to tutor for them. And that's just because this deck prioritizes uh, getting tokens and the critical mass and then getting the card advantage, just because a lot of the card advantage requires you to be making creatures or, or playing creatures. And so it's more suitable to set up an engine for those, uh, you know, some sort of token engine uh, before you tutor for a card advantage piece. In general, uh, it's some Jetmere builds are heavier on the card advantage and lower on the uh, token production, you know, if they're a Jetmere token stack. And I found that it's actually better to flip those two, get your token engine going and then use your creature shooter to go find yourself a card advantage piece and play it. So here we have the burst, uh, burst draw. Sylvan Library doesn't really need much of an explanation. Uh, Toski and Oren Frostfang are great tutors. Once you've established a token engine, uh, tutor for one of these, get them in a play, and then you should be able to refill your hand uh, in a single turn of attacks. Then you have the more incremental card advantage pieces. So Esper Sentinel, it uh, doesn't really need much of an explanation, but when you have a token engine, uh, the other three, Welcoming Vampire, Tocasius Welcome, and Benny Brax are all going to lead you to draw a card each turn, uh, which incrementally adds up. You've essentially drawn three more cards uh, by the time your next turn begins. 
token generators, we have 10 of these. Uh, it's, it's enough so that we don't generally need a tutor for them. You're likely to see one by turn three, turn four, uh, just from natural draws. And so here I've listed the combat trigger uh, token generators. We have Adeline, uh, Hanwir Garrison, Krenko, and Mural. Mural is the strongest of these just because she has a built-in stacks effect, but the other ones are especially important just because they are a burst token creation, and burst token creation is typically how you have those turn five, turn six, threaten to kill the table type of games. The other token engines include Scoot Swarm. This one's good because we run a lot of fetch lands, and so we can often make uh, two tokens um, after we cast the Scoot Swarm, but uh, this is the slowest token maker in the deck. Um, we also have these incremental token makers, so Tender Shoot, Wolverine Riders, and the Dragon Lair Spider. These will guarantee you at least one token uh, on each turn. I actually like them better than some of the burst draw or burst uh, uh, burst token creators that trigger on attack, uh, and that's just because, from my experience, because these are more expensive and slower. A lot of times, uh, a board wipe has already been cast before you've been able to play one of these down and so um, a lot of games i played you know someone cast their commander and then opponent cast removal to remove that guy's commander you know people have spent removal usually by the time you are able to get one of these bottom three down and so i often find that they stick just because they're just a little bit slower and of course we have two other forms of burst token creation that are not attack triggers we have elspeth sun's champion uh, which is also a form of a board wipe. And then Call of the Copper Coats is one of the strongest cards in this deck. After you've been through a board wipe, uh, usually someone's going to break parity and get ahead after the board wipe. And then Call of the Copper Coats allows you to instant speed, make a bunch of tokens, uh, cast Jet Mirror the next turn, and potentially uh, th threaten an Alpha Strike. Uh, this deck, because it is a uh, more fair strategy, uh, it is fast and fair, but it runs a lot of interaction stacks and protection just because there are so many pieces that are critical to protect as well as uh, so many enemy threats that we need to deal with that could just hose our entire game plan. So we have the catch-alls, we have the red counter spell, and then we have grasp of fate. We have the artifact and enchantment removal. Our shards here is the strongest. Uh, token generation plus our shards is one of the uh, most annoying combos to deal with in the game and this deck is capable of doing it very well. And then we have the creature hosers. Uh, these are often used on a lot of enemy commanders so anytime I see an enemy commander that is uh, some sort of enabler card advantage engine or you know something that uh, I just don't want them to have for a long time. Uh, Dark Soul Mutation, Kenrith, Swords, Plowshares, and even Path Exile are really good against those. Um, especially true because some commanders, like if you ever play against Tox Real or an enemy Elish and Warren as the commander, their commander is literally a, a hard counter to your deck. So it's really important to be able to hose their commander as soon as it comes down. And then we have the silver bullet stacks effects. These are best cast whenever uh, you're, whenever you assess that, or whenever you conclude that someone else is on a faster game plan than you. So if if someone is playing some sort of fast combo strategy, or even just a fast and fair strategy that you think that has, you know is, has taken off faster than yours, whether it's because they had a better opening hand or you just had a slow hand or any sort of reason uh, whenever you're doing a threat assessment and you conclude that you know they're just farther ahead than you then it's time to start using uh, tutors to get one of these before doing anything else just so you can uh, slow the game down a bit and make it more fair for yourself and so a lot of these are very specific hosers uh, I want to talk about uh, a couple of them uh, most of these don't need an explanation. Yasharn uh, does. Yasharn is one that stops people from fetching. So many players are playing three or four or five color decks, and Yasharn is especially strong against them because they're going to be running fetch lands. Um, 
And so Yashorn does stop your own fetch lands, but he gets you two lands when he two basic lands when he comes into play, and so it's not that big of a deal. But the real thing that Yasharn protects your board against are cards like Toxic Deluge, Ratchet Bomb, uh, Pernicious Deed, anything that requires an opponent to pay life or sacrifice the permanent in order to trigger its effect. Uh, I should say activate its effect. Uh, Yasharn stops that. It also stops treasure-based uh, strategies as well. Limvala is good against other decks that have mana dorks or rely on activated abilities. And of course, any deck that is playing a lot of non-creature spells, both of these are really, really uh, good against them. Deafening Silence has actually uh, impressed me. Um, for one mana, it does a lot of work. And then on the protection side, uh, we have a lot of instant speed protection just because this sort of deck is the one is the kind that gets blown out in the combat step. You know, you cast Jetmir, you move to combat, you declare your attacks, and then someone removes Jetmir after you've declared your attacks, and suddenly you've basically board wiped yourself because now your creatures have lost the Jetmir buffs, and because they're a bunch of like one one tokens, you know, they just get blocked, and then you lose pretty much your board. And so it is very important to have ways to protect Jetmir. Uh, at instant speed. Um, I prefer instants where possible, but there's also creature-based protection uh, that is a little bit more obvious for your opponents to see, but also do a great job as well. The main difference is that the creature-based protection here uh, will usually not protect your entire board from a board wipe, uh, whereas the others might. And of course, there's so much uh, interaction in this deck that I'd make a second slide for it. So I put the Path to Exile, and then Elish Thorn here as other forms of creature removal. And then Selfless Spirit is probably the weakest form of protection that's in the deck. It's very obvious, doesn't really have hexproof, uh, but if it does protect against uh, removal, that's probably going to be sorcery speed. There's two board wipes in the deck, and both of them are specifically chosen. Um, so by invitation only is very good because if we have a token engine, it can often lead to a one-sided board wipe. Um, you pick some number that is equal to or less than the number of tokens you have, and then usually that wipes the opponent's boards, but uh, allows you to still keep your token-making creature. Um, by invitation only also gets around many Voltron decks uh, that have protection or like indestructible. Uh, it gets around um, decks like Avacyn. Uh, pretty much anything that uh, you can't beat from typical board wipes by invitation only gets around. And then Winds of Abandon, also really good. It's not a destroy, it's an exile, and it's one-sided when overloaded. And so it's it's very strong. Um, it's especially punishing to opponents that overcommit their hand, because even though they do ramp a basic land for every single creature that gets exiled, uh, a lot of decks rely on graveyard effects and a lot of uh, opponents, assuming you've been able to pop their card advantage sources, uh, you know, giving them a bunch of land but leaving them with few cards in hand is a trade-off that is always worth making. Of course, there's also uh, a lot of lands in this deck. Um, we need to, to hit our land drops pretty efficiently uh, in order to play the game, uh, but we also don't want to flood, and so there's nine fetch lands and uh, 26 uh, other lands. The mulligan strategy is pretty simple. Uh, you want a mulligan for a hand that has some sort of acceleration. Uh, one thing that I didn't list in here is Deep Gnome Terramancer, and I want to talk about that just uh, for a second. Uh, Deep Gnome Terramancer is largely a judgment call. Um, it's not guaranteed to ramp you, whereas all of these are. And so if you have an opening hand with Deep Gnome Terramancer, two lands, and uh, none of these, I would probably take that free mulligan. Um, depending on what my opponents are playing. If I already know their commanders and one of them is green, or if I think that you know some of my opponents are going to be playing fetch lands, I absolutely will keep that opening hand with Deep Gnome Terramancer. But I have had games where I kept Deep Gnome Terramancer in the opening hand, watched opponents not play fetch lands, not play uh, you know Kodama's Reach or Cultivate, but instead play Artifacts, and then just sit there and be like, man, I really should have uh, probably taken that free mulligan. In general... Uh, I would say don't mull past 6, and so if the 6 is playable, even if it's slow, I would still keep that 6. Uh, the game plan I'm going to go over briefly. It's easier to read in the primer. 
uh, and also more detailed than the primer, so I would refer to that. Uh, first is you want to cast your acceleration as soon as you can, so your mana ramp, your mana dorks. There's some considerations you have to make here, so sometimes you'll face the trade-off of do I prioritize removal or do I cast another mana dork? And from my experience, if you're playing against a Voltron deck, specifically an aggro Voltron deck, if it's some sort of slower Voltron deck, don't worry about it. Uh, but um, if you're playing against a fast Voltron deck like Skullbriar or something that is um, just coming out the gate swinging, I would prioritize removing their commander uh, because you really just have to pop their commander once to slow them down enough to uh, get in the game. Like it's it's much better to remove their commander once, force them to uh, recast it, and then um, you know build your acceleration uh, after they're working on recasting their commander. Uh, than to cast your acceleration and then realize that you can't remove their Voltron commander because they've just put too many things on it. So that's my thoughts on acceleration or removal versus Voltron. Uh, and then, of course, if there is a very strong value engine that's in play, if an opponent has Sylvan Library or Rhystic Study or something that's just going to run away with the game, I absolutely would pop that uh, before casting further acceleration. And then you want to set up a token engine. It's really important that you don't cast more than one. Um, you don't want to be tapping out entirely with this deck. You want to leave mana dorks up and untapped if possible, or at least some lands untapped so that you can hold up protection. Uh, and that's just because there are going to be games where people do play board wipes. And if you have another token engine in hand, you will be able to rebuild after that board wipe pretty quickly. Uh, it's certainly not worth it too, because a lot of your token engines uh, only need to uh, trigger for like one turn cycle or one or two attacks to get you into critical mass. So there's really not that, med that much advantage to casting another token engine uh, at, the, at the same time anyway. And then after you have a token engine, you want to tutor for some kind of draw engine. And because a lot of the draw engines are based on attacking or making tokens, um, that is why the general priority has been set up the token engine first and then tutor for a draw engine. And it's really important that you get that draw engine into play because commander is larger resource war. If you decide to tutor instead for just a creature, just so you can get up to critical mass, uh, you're probably going to lose the game uh, if you don't have protection in hand, which uh, usually you get protection by having a draw engine uh, draw you into cards. If you just tutor for another creature so you can bump your creature count from 8 to 9, and then you attack with Jetmere, they'll probably remove Jetmere at instant speed, and you'll be very, very sad. And so it's important to remember that Commander is largely a resource war. And then this step here arguably can be done at any point. Um, it's a judgment call of how fast is the game plan of your opponents. Is someone else faster along than you are? Are they playing a faster strategy? Because if that is true, then you probably need to slow down one of your other steps and tutor for some sort of hate bear. Now, there's also the situation where someone is playing black and you are pretty certain they probably have Toxic Deluge in their deck. And for that reason, it can be important just to tutor for Yasharn and get him into play just to protect yourself against that. Um, a lot of those decks also are probably running fetch lands and so uh, being able to hose their fetch lands is, is really good too. Um, in general, try not to play Hate Bear until you have a token engine going, but uh, if you do conclude that an opponent is on a faster strategy than you and they are just further ahead in the game than you are, then uh, switching over to the slow them down strategy is advised uh, because you, you want to do that before you proceed with the rest of the steps or the other steps that you skipped. Otherwise, the game might just be over uh, before you can even get to those steps. And then lastly, once you have protection available, in tournament, you're going to have nine creatures on board. Remember that Jetmare also counts, so really you're, you're trying to count to eight. Um, and you don't want to be casting Jetmare for any reason other than uh, threatening to win the game. And so you need to have nine creatures during combat. And the math here can be tricky because there are creatures that make tokens during combat, like Adelaine, like Miral, Krenko, etc. You need to have calculated how many creatures you're going to have during combat. So if you have six creatures in play, 
at the start of your turn. You cast Jet Mirror, that's seven. And if you have something like Krenko or Mural, uh, you're probably going to be at nine by the time you declare your attacks. Like you move two attacks, uh, and then you declare your attacks, and then your your attack trigger, uh, your attack triggers create the additional tokens, and then now all your creatures have double strike, trample, vigilance, and that can be enough to. Uh, threaten lethal against either one or two players, or possibly even all three, depending on life totals. And so it's it's important to know what the math is going to be uh, whenever you have declared your attacks. And you generally don't want to be moving to these attacks. You don't want to be casting Jet Mirror moving to a, an Alpha Strike unless you have protection available. And because you probably won't have protection unless you set up a draw engine, it's really, really important that you follow all of these steps. And so... Just keep that in mind. Um, in general, Grand Abolisher and Mural are probably the best forms of protection in the deck, but otherwise you're going to have to rely on instant speed or some sort of creature-based uh, instant speed um, hoser or something that can uh, protect Jet Mirror against an instant speed bounce or instant speed swords. Uh, because if you attack with Jet Mirror and that he's removed, um, or rather if you attack while Jet Mirror is in play and he is removed, uh, again, you will most likely just board wipe yourself because now your creatures are all really weak and can be blocked. And so it's it's really important to not go for this until you have uh, insurance against it. So that is the Jet Mirror deck. Please check out some of the replays if you want to see the deck in action as well as some further analysis.